Kia ora, Sir Cam, how are we? Good. Man, I just want to, uh, thanks Whangaparoa. My whanau. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, just that special time of worship, man. I was just standing inside a stage getting so emotional and the thing that just kept going through my head is, this is the sound of Aotearoa. Man, this, it was so powerful, so authentic. Thanks for that, good time. So thank you so much, I wanna honor you guys. So uh, yeah, last year I wore some Lycra and um, some of you are still emotionally scarred. And I noticed a few youth groups didn't bring as many people this year and sorry, but I'm not really sorry. <laughs> it was a good time, but I'm that guy, people, that likes to talk about things that nobody else really likes to talk about, you know? And they're like, oh, they, we don't want to talk about that from the, from the stage. I'm just a straight up kind of guy that just goes there. Yeah, and so on that note, no, <laughs> I've got a story for you. Now, we all know, well, hopefully we do, that Boys and girls have different bits. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Some of you are looking surprised. Honestly, I know this. I know this because my wife does puberty talks and she told me. So I know that it's true. I trust her. So boys and girls, they've got different bits. Let's just leave it there. I wanna tell you a story of when I was in year 13 at high school, only a couple of years ago. I'm smiling now, but I'll be crying when I tell a story. Uh, I woke up one morning, people. I did, believe it or not. I know, thank you. No, I woke up one morning and I had this excruciating pain in my lower gut. It was as if I had been kicked when no bloke ever wants to be kicked. It was unbelievably painful. Now, when a bloke is kicked in the nether regions, the pain is, is pretty intense. It's kind of like this big wave that comes and it's unbearable, but then it kind of subsides and eases and goes away. But on this occasion, there was no easing of the pain. It was thick and persistent and just awful. And I got a bit worried, people. And so, but as a bloke, as a bloke, what I thought would be a good idea is, you know, I oh, just... She'll be right, mate. Let's just head off to school, no problems. Let's just see how we go here. So I went off to school. Yeah, I was sitting in my, uh, in my form room and uh, the pain was just so intense. And I told a couple of my mates, they're like, bro, what's going on? I was like, mate, I don't know, but it, it hurts. And uh, they came up with some genius ideas. I thought they were friends. <laughs> so what happened was one dude uh, said to me, he's like, Josh, why don't you just try and jog it off? I was like, mate, I will try anything to get rid of this pain. And so I'm like, just trying to just jog it off. But honestly, I tried that. I wanted to punch him in the throat. It hurt so much. Didn't help one iota. Then another mate's like, oh, Josh, why don't you just try stretching? So I was like doing these lunges, you know, just trying to stretch it out. And it, and it worked for about all of five seconds. And then the pain just came back. I was like, mate, this is not a good time. So I thought, right, I'm going to the doctors. I, I need some help. And so I went to the doctors and all he said, he, he just said, you need to get to hospital. I was like, what's going on? And so I got rushed to hospital. I got sat before a surgeon. My, uh, my mum came along with me, kept me company. And uh, <laughs> mums are good like that. And uh, 
I don't know what you're cheering about. This wasn't a lot of pain, people. This was a traumatic experience. And uh, so I'm sitting before the surgeon going, what's going on? And then the surgeon comes in and delivers the news. I, w I wasn't pregnant and having children, no. <laughs> Close. Uh, he said, Josh, you're a bit uh, twisted and dying. <laughs> Solid. And basically they were just, the surgeon said to me, they said, Josh, we've got to get you into surgery, otherwise you could lose them. And, uh, and then you'll never be able to have children and all that sort of stuff. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, Josh, you have crossed a line. Maybe close to it, but I need to tell you, this is a serious medical issue, people. One in five young men, will, true story, one in five men will struggle with this. And uh, it's a serious medical issue. And, but I can just remember the, uh, sitting there being a bit freaked out, even asking mum, I'm like, what sort of qualification does this guy have to handle such precious cargo, you know? Like, <laughs> is he, does he know what he's doing? And, uh, and then, because I'm an extrovert, right? I speak before I think sometimes, uh, all the time. And, and so I just said to the, to the surgeon, well, what makes you qualified? How long have you been studying? And um, he was like, 14 years. Oh, no, that's fair enough. You can have a crack. Uh, so anyway, folks, I'll move on from this because I can see some of you starting to dry reach. Now, long and short of it was that I got sorted out. The surgeon did his work. And now because of that great surgery, I have two fantastic, beautiful, well-functioning children. Both of which couldn't come with me. The two beautiful girls left at them at home. But then there was the recovery process. It wasn't too bad, but it just took a bit of time. I had to follow the surgeons, the surgeons' guidelines, the surgeons' rules, and he said, make sure that you, you, you manage to do this, that, and the other thing. Again, I won't go into details. One of the things was, make sure you wear support, supportive undies when you're playing sport. And uh, oh, oh, good call. Why am I telling you this? I don't know. Oh, I just thought it would be a great story to kick things off with, break the ice. <laughs> this is like the Easter story. <laughs> I want to tell you why. I'm not being disrespectful. I want to tell you why. Let, just give me a moment. <laughs> Here's the deal, people, that our world is twisted, numb, and dying. And Jesus came at Easter time to restore the blood flow so that we would have life. Did you get the point, or do I need to stay there a little bit longer? Or No, I'm kidding. But on a serious note, like if we just pull back for a minute and we take a look at our world, and take a look at our world, you see, we see so many people that their God is power and money. And what they do in their lives is they chase power and money over everything else. They'll trample on whoever they possibly can to make sure that they earn more pow power and earn more money, get more power and earn more money. Man, people, our world is twisted numb and dying. It's broken. You just have to walk through your schools for just 10 minutes and what you'll see is you'll see people getting bullied and ripped out by other people just so that the bully will feel better about themselves. Meanwhile, the person getting bullied suffers massively. They have identity crises so often. I've been in that space. Sometimes the severe cases of, of uh, online bullying, cyberbullying, has caused people to make horrific decisions because of the self-worth and value. People, our world is twisted, numb, and dying. You look around and you see the pain that exists because of abuse. And what's more, our society has sucked 
at creating space for victims to be able to have a voice and to be loved and cared for well. We're getting better at it, people. But the result has been, as we've talked about, as Esther's talked about, as Justin's talked about, is that shame has so often attached itself to so many abuse victims. That isn't fair. Our world is twisted, numb, and dying. We seek our value and our worth from other people. When somebody likes us, we like ourselves. When somebody doesn't like us, we struggle to like ourselves. To fill the void, we turn to substances. We turn to some of sexual relationships just to feel good about ourselves. And it leaves us broken. People, this world is twisted, numb, and dying. But Jesus. But Jesus. You see, Jesus came like the great surgeon, better than any great surgeon, to untwist things, to restore the blood flow, to bring life. I've got a verse, John 10.10. 10. The story of Easter. Jesus came because of his deep love for humanity. He came because he created us in a way that we were no longer functioning in. He, he noticed that this world was twisted, numb, and dying, and he's going, that's not what I created you for. I want to bring restoration and untwist things so that you can know life rich and satisfying, John 10.10 10 says. So he came and he died on the cross on Friday, and today he rose again, defeating the enemy, defeating every power that could possibly hold us in a space of being twisted, numb, and dying. Every power was broken that could hold us in a way of life that we were not designed to live in. And he's come and he's declared that I have come to bring life, life abundant, rich, and satisfying life. Now, I looked at that verse, first of all, and, and that wasn't the translation that I originally um, was reading, and it just said, I've come to give life and life abundant. And I kind of thought, what the heck does that even mean? You know, like, that sounds fantastic. You know, abundant life, but like, what does that actually mean? What does that mean for you tomorrow, the next day, the next day? It's fantastic that that life, that twisted, numb, and dying life, that, that this culture and this world sits in is, is no good for us, but... But what is Jesus restoring us to? What is this life and life abundant? There's a, a word that's used in the original text, zoe. Say zoe. You're now Greek scholars. Congratulations. Just kidding. Just kidding. That, but the truth is, you know as much Greek as me now. And this word... This idea of abundant life says this, the state of one who is possessed of vitality or is animate, of absolute fullness of life, real and genuine, a life active and vigorous. People, this is the life Jesus came to restore. So that instead of us stuck in a place of, you know, striving for power and for money being the biggest gods in our life, he's come to untwist things so that, the greatest thing in our lives would be God and other people, that we could serve one another, we could serve God, and we could love God, we could love one another and cherish one another. Instead of bullying one another to feel better about ourselves and pulling other people down just so we can get a few kicks and, you know, feel like the boys like us. Over here, Jesus is unraveling that to declare over every single person that you are so worthy, so valuable, so loved that you are good enough. That instead of trying to seek our identity in relationships and in substance abuse, we can have a revelation and a relationship with Jesus that restores our identity so that no matter what season we go through in life, you can know that you are cherished, that you are a child of God, and that you are worth something so valuable that our God was prepared to die for you. Not only that, people, that in this twisted state of being, hope is lost. Dreams have been crushed. Our wonder has vanished. Jesus has come to restore hope, to restore dreams that maybe you've had on your life that have been crushed. He has come to restore them because this is what you were created for. 
And this is where life is found. So the great question that I know is on the lips of every single person in here is how do you go from A to B? So we say that Jesus has come to, uh, he came over 2,000 years ago to untwist things like the great surgeon, to restore the blood flow, to bring life to us the way we were designed to function. But how do we actually get there? Because if we're honest, this life here, this twisted life is a life that we all experience. But yet Jesus did the work 2,000 years ago. So how do we transition from here to here? Fantastic question. I want to take you back to the story at the start because I know you love it. There's four things, right? So I went to Bible college and um, they told me that I needed to have three points and that made me, you know, that's a solid sermon. I've gone four, so um, I'm not even sure if I'm saved anymore, but so um, that's a joke, people, all right? I've got four quick points. This is how you transition into this life and become who God is calling you to be. First thing is this, acknowledge the pain. Say acknowledge the pain. Acknowledge the pain. Man, just like my story, there had to be a starting point, a starting point that said, man, there's just something not quite right. Something not quite right about how I'm functioning. There's something deep inside of me that just yearns for more. Maybe you're stuck in a performance-based mentality of always trying to earn people's uh, love and affection. I don't know what it is, but the first point of contact is to acknowledge the pain. That something just isn't quite right. The second thing, reject the lies. Say reject the lies. Now, people. This is when my mates come back into it. The filthy, rotten guys that tried to tell me to jog it off. Not a good time. Man, in our lives, there's so many lies that will hold us in this twisted state of being. So many lies that will hold us in this space. We need to acknowledge something's not right. We need to reject the lies that are holding us here. And it leads to the third thing. We need to allow Jesus to do surgery on our hearts. John 10.10, 10, I'd love, I actually, don't, just bring up the next slide. Yeah, I, I skipped a bit. But bring it, yeah, yeah, here we go. Fantastic. You know, the thief comes to rob, kill, and destroy. Coming back to point two, I forgot to do this. Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, this comes in a passage of scripture, and Jesus, and it leads into my third point of allowing Jesus to do surgery on our hearts. This comes in a passage of scripture, and Jesus is talking uh, in parables to a bunch of people around him, and he's, and he's basically talking about uh, him being the shepherd and us being the sheep, and he was also the gatepost. He was, he's sending this message, and he, and he wraps it up with this. He said that the thief's, the thief's purpose is to rob, kill, and destroy. The thief's purpose, the liar, the father of lies, wants to keep you twisted, but yet I've come that you would have life to untwist things. But here's the thing, people. You can pull it down now. In this parable, Jesus makes this clear statement that he is the only one qualified to do surgery on our hearts. So often the enemy will try and pull us into, into numbing the pain. We acknowledge maybe something's not right, but yet there's so many lies that are holding us in that space where Jesus says, there is nothing you can do. There's no substance, no relationship with people that you can turn to that will untwist things for you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the only one qualified to restore you, to bring healing, to do surgery, to restore the blood flow so that you would function in hope and life, you would know your identity, that you would come alive again, that, that your, your dreams would be restored, people. Jesus is the only one, the great surgeon. Can I get an amen? I can't believe that worked. I've always wanted to do that. I like, sometimes pretend I'm like Bishop T.D. Jakes in front of the mirror. Uh, anyway, completely inappropriate joke. We're just getting serious. Fourth point, recovery. Man, 
I really believe strongly, and I'm even sensing now the presence of God here. Like, Jesus, through his spirit, is wanting to do some ministry and some surgery on some hearts tonight, to bring some healing, to untwist things, to, to rebuke some of the lies, and to bring some truth that will set you free. That's what scripture tells us. But here's the deal, people. It's not just about tonight. This untwisting process, this process of stepping into what God created you to be is an ongoing process that he does healing on us, yes, but we've also got to follow the recovery plan. Where's some support of undies? Listen to what this great surgeon Jesus has said. He provides some ways. He gives us truth. We've actually got to start to follow him. Otherwise, we risk getting twisted again. And so tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to create some space for Holy Spirit, for Jesus, the great surgeon, to start some surgery on our hearts, to start to restore some brokenness. But I need to tell you that tonight's the start of the journey. That hopefully tonight, and we are believing that tonight, man, you will hear the whisper, the voice of God declaring his love over you again, and you might not have heard that before. That the broken hearts will start to mend, but as you go from camp, it's a choice to go, Jesus, I'm going to continue to follow what you are saying to me as the one that knows the surgical process, because I want to be fully restored and I don't want to go back. So Blue, why don't... Why don't you come up? But I'd just love us just to close our eyes. Jesus, in this moment, we want to just open our hearts to you, God. You are in the business of restoration. You are in the business of untwisting and causing the blood to flow so that we would have life the way you designed us to. But God, we want to acknowledge that in this in this moment, we all carry stuff, we all carry pain, we all carry areas in our lives where that are still a little bit twisted. And so, Father, tonight we want to lay them before you, asking your spirit to speak truth. 